Good evening, everyone. I guess it's not the most beautiful evening out there, but thank you for being here, and we're in for a very, very terrific treat here with uh, Dr. Susan Hockfield, who is, um, uh, the, of course, former president of MIT and a renowned scientist. Uh, in a moment, I'll turn to Drew Faust to introduce our speaker, but um, I wanted to start by saying a couple of words about the Godkin Lecture. The Godkin Lecture is our, um, is, was founded in 1903 in honor of Edward L. Godkin, who was an American journalist, uh, newspaper editor, founder of the nation, um, and the lecture was to provide notable a notable platform for addressing the essentials of free government, duties of the citizen, and the like. And so through the years, we've had some extraordinary speakers, ranging from Nelson Rockefeller, James Q. Wilson, Larry Summers, Antonin Scalia, uh, Nan Cohan, uh, Tom Schelling, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, it is definitely our most prestigious lecture. And so now I want to turn it over to Drew Faust, who will do our introduction. Let me just say a couple of words. Uh, she is the 28th president of Harvard University uh, and the Lincoln Professor of History uh, in the ha Faculty of Arts and Sciences. But much more important, she is someone who has inspired the extraordinary combination and talent and energy of this university, whether it be in science, whether it be in bringing together the different schools they work on everything from innovation to uh, such as technology and the like, but also public policy and the sorts of issues around this university that we all care about here at the Kennedy School, uh, or the arts and culture and other things. Throughout it all, she has provided a steady and a really quite uh, inspiring hand. And I have to just tell you, I've had three presidents and I really like working with Drew. Um, <laughs> and with that, let me turn it over to Drew Faust. David, that's very kind. He often, when forced to introduce me, reminds people that I'm his boss. So I just want to give that little discount to the, <laughs> to the generosity. But David, I really like working with you too. <laughs> thank so you. thank you. Thanks to everyone for joining us. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce this year's Godkin Lecture, my colleague and friend, Susan Hockfield. As I was thinking about how I could best summarize Susan's achievements, I was reminded of two quotes that in my mind, bookend her presidency at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I think in many ways define her leadership. Just before her inauguration in 2005, an undergraduate who had interviewed her and her family for a radio program said, and I'm quoting him, she makes you feel like she wants you to succeed. And then seven years later, another student de described her as, and I quote again, a leader who makes you want to step up and deliver. Susan has the ability to inspire people to believe in their ideas, in one another, and in their shared capacity to make a difference in the world. It's evident in what she accomplished at MIT, attracting engaged and highly talented students and faculty from diverse backgrounds, building new and strengthened connections around the world, establishing a model innovation cluster in Kendall Square, just to name a few of her achievements. I was pleased to be her partner in initiatives that joined our institu institutions together in unprecedented ways, the Broad Institute, the Reagan Institute, and edX. Such collaborations would have been unfeasible, if not unthinkable, a generation ago and in no small part because of Susan's foresight, what well may be known as the convergence era in the history of biomedical research and development will be anchored here in Cambridge. And we're benefiting too from the convergences that have brought Harvard and MIT so much closer together as well. Her keen focus on MIT's growth and success was complemented by a broader role of the research university in economic growth. During her presidency, Susan co-chaired the steering committee of President Obama's Advanced Manufacturing Partnership and emerged as a powerful voice in the national conversation about innovation, and especially as it relates to climate change. As she put it, if one advance could transform America's prospects, it would be ready access at scale to a range of affordable, renewable, low-carbon energy technologies. 
The MIT Energy Initiative, dubbed MIGHTY in the spirit of its acronym, began under her leadership and continues to draw on strengths across and beyond the Institute to advance energy technologies as well as the policies and systems to support their widespread adoption and use. Speaking at Georgetown in January about the future of universities, Susan said, while people don't like change, no one can deny you, are an exper deny you an experiment. So please join me in welcoming a lifelong experimenter who stepped up and delivered on her inauguration promise to let MIT's light shine on the world. She's a leader who continues to inspire me and so many others in her deep commitment to the highest ideals of higher education. Susan Hoxie. I just said thank you, Drew, that was very sweet and wonderful. And I have to say, I would just echo all of the lovely she, things she said about working together. One of the great joys of my presidency was the chance to work closely with Drew to design ways that Harvard and MIT could pool our resources to do more than we could on our own. I also want to thank David for um, inviting me to give this lecture, but also for having hosted me for my sabbatical year following my presidency here in the Belfer Center. Also thank Graham Allison as a, another one of my hosts. It was a delightful year having stepped out of the office of the president at MIT to come here and sit and listen as you know, waves of people would come through describing the most interesting things going on in the world in the most startling terms. And it was wonderful to be a part of it and I'm delighted to continue as a member of the uh, Belfer Center today. So um, it's a privilege to have been asked to deliver the Godkin Lecture. I tried to get the list of all the Godkin Lectures to determine how many of them had actually spoken about science and technology. I didn't get the list, but th th I'm sure there were a couple. And um, it won't surprise any of you that I'm going to be talking about technology today because, you know, what else would a former president of MIT want to talk about? Um, but uh, one of the most fun things, one of the great delights of being the leader of a research university of sort of Harvard or MIT that is that you can walk out of your office and stop anyone in the corridor, a faculty or a student, and ask them what they're working on. And as they describe their research, as they describe their thinking, as they describe the kinds of things they imagine are you know, just around the corner, I would say you know, my jaw would drop and I would find myself in a future I had not yet imagined. So today's topic is really, in actuality, a question of where does the future come from? Where will the future come from? And how does the university help invent the future? So I'm going to start with the future we are living in today. Actually, you, you all look great. You, do, you mind, do you mind if I just take a picture? <laughs> uh, just joking. I'm not going to take a picture. Any of you have one of these things? Does anyone not have one of these things? This is the shape of the 20th century. And I don't think anyone can contest that digital technologies transformed our lives in the 20th century in a way that nothing else has. Truly the great transformation uh, of lives, of businesses, of everything. Uh, that these digital technologies have enabled aviation, space flight, obviously smartphones, instant communication. And the question is, where did these come from? What are the antecedents of these marvelous technologies that animate so much of our world today? Well, they are products, I would argue, of the 20th century convergence of the physical sciences with engineering. So I want to trace today's future back to before the dawn of the 20th century. And I will use only one example. I could have chosen any one of a number, but I will choose one, which is electricity. So if we think about what was going on in the 19th century, on the left is Michael Faraday, of whom I'm a great fan, who did some extraordinary experiments describing the behavior of electricity. He described electromagnetism um, you know, early in the 19th century and continued a series of absolutely remarkable observations and experiments. But he was looking at the behavior of electricity. He didn't know what electricity was. And it wasn't until J.J. Uh, Thompson discovered the electron and described the electron late in the 19th century that we began to get a sense of what electricity really is. There was an accelerating pace of discoveries in physics around that time, toward the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And as I think about what 
Thompson and his colleagues did, they developed a parts list of the physical universe. Now, having hung out with engineers for the last you know, eight or nine years, I can tell you, engineers love parts lists. <laughs> they can pick them up and turn them into uh, techniques, into objects that you could never have imagined, and that's what happened with the products this parts lift list from the unraveling, the dissecting of the physical universe. So, so engineers picked up this parts list and they turned it into vacuum tubes and transistors and silicon-based circuits. And truly, it was the convergence of the physical sciences with engineering that created all of these marvelous technologies of the 20th century. So we have, uh, obviously, advances in aviation and medical imaging and supercomputing. And I could have had you know, four more slides illustrating the various ways in which the convergence of the physical sciences with engineering has changed our lives. This convergence was really accelerated during World War II, where the United States made massive investments in research and development and R&D and created, really, the technological miracles of the Second World War. Radar, sonar, nuclear weapons, but also nuclear power. They laid the foundations of the global positioning systems, of computing and the internet, the list goes on and on. But another product of that massive investment during World War II was our ability to explore space, set the foundations of the space race. Now, um, as I look around the audience, I can see that many of you uh, were uh, conscious and aware when Sputnik went up, and uh, many of you will remember the sense of terror as they, we you know, followed the course of that satellite in 1957. Well, the United States was already in the space business, but it really started a fantastic space race. Um, John F. Kennedy put his uh, force behind it, and I think it's great to quote from Kennedy, here we are in the Kennedy Forum. And he said that we choose to go to the moon in this decade, and you can, but I want to cut to the chase, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. He set out a national ambition, a national ethos. So not only would the space race be critical to our national security issues, it was absolutely essential in terms of economic growth, but it was a sense of setting a national ambition, a national ethos that influenced the country in absolutely remarkable ways. Now, I often say that I grew up under the shadow of Sputnik. And sure, there was a shadow, but it was a great excitement about the possibility of science transforming the world. And so I'm going to reveal a little bit of my reflections on that at the time. So when I was in second grade, I wrote a little essay on this. Uh, there I am, the one with the halo. Oh, it's not a halo. It's just a red <laughs> circle around me, uh, with my three sisters. And I have taken the liberty of actually interpreting my second grade spelling. Um, it's amazing when you look at these things, you know, things that you did when you were quite young. And I understood sentence construction, but I didn't understand spelling. And it was a problem that it continued to dog me. Spell checker was a great innovation. Um, in any case, so I convey how interesting, fascinating, how exciting it was to be able to follow science where science would lead. This national ambition set out by President Kennedy translated into individual excitement. It could be fun, um, but also led to a sense of reflected glory, whether you were engaged in the process of racing to the moon or whether you were just part of the nation that was racing to the moon, you felt a sense of national ambition and national uh, elation when we accomplished that in 1969. I would point out that this little essay was written in 1959, 10 years before we actually got to the moon, but I knew we were going to get there. In any case, the convergence of physical sciences with engineering really has been the story of the 20th century and its technology triumphs. It produced new products and entirely new industries. In 1900, there wasn't an electronics industry, and there certainly wasn't a computer industry or an information industry. But this convergence of the physical sciences with engineering produced it, uh, produced extraordinary economic growth, and has been very good, not just for the nation and the world. It was the most powerful transformational current of the 20th century, and it permeates every nook and cranny of our lives. So now I want to fast forward into the 21st century, or near the 21st century. I'm going to talk about biology, the life sciences, the study of living things. 
Now, at the period in the beginning of the 20th century when physics was getting quantitative and predictive, biology remained largely a descriptive taxonomic science, you know, to many not so very interesting. Some of us would have been motivated by biology, by biology in any case. But starting about the middle of the 20th century, there have been three enormous, I would call them revolutions, in modern biology. So the first is called molecular biology. And I would start the revolution in um, molecular biology to the elucidation of the structure of DNA by James Watson and Francis Crick. Their paper describing the structure of uh, DNA came out in 1953. That's Watson and Crick to the left and their model of DNA to the right. And the structure was an extraordinary achievement. But beyond the structure itself, it re revealed something truly revolutionary, a mechanism for heredity has transformed the way we think about our world and precipitated this wonderful revolution in molecular biology. It provided a unifying principle for all living things. So whether you studied viruses or plants or mammals, you could speak to one another in the very same language, the language of DNA. This unifying principle for biology has been enormously important. There have also been important products out of this first revolution. We became able to identify the genes that give rise to diseases, and that enables us to design therapies that are designed against those uh, gene targets. So I will describe this very briefly just in the context of cancer. Cancer is a disease of dividing cells. Standard cancer therapy, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy kills all dividing cells, and so you can kill cancer cells, but we have a lot of good cell division going on. There are a lot of normal processes that include cell division. And when you administer chemotherapy or radiation therapy, those good cells get killed also. The promise of targeted therapy is if you identify a gene that is uniquely carried by cancer cells, you can hit that gene with a therapy and thereby kill the cancer cell, leaving the normal cells relatively untouched. Uh, that promise has been seen in the development of uh, a number of targeted uh, cancer drugs. The first was Herceptin for a certain form of breast cancer. Gleevec, these are therapies that kill the bad while sparing the good. I have to say in terms of the, you know, with the time course of development from 1953 when the structure of DNA was first described and when Herceptin went on the market was 43 years. It takes time to work these things out. The first revolution in molecular, uh, in, in modern biology, molecular biology gave rise to the second, and the second is the area of genomics. During the molecular biology revolution, we could go after single genes, single proteins, one by one, but that was insufficient. So we moved then into an age where we could go through to massive gene sequencing, understanding the whole genetic sequence, I don't understand, under, be able to read out the sequence of the entire genome of an organism. And have the computational power to analyze that data. It has allowed us to start to unravel the, disease, the genes around complex diseases like diabetes, even autism and schizophrenia. The genes underlying those diseases are beginning to be studied. It allowed us beyond that to um, understand something about evolution. We are now sequencing the microbiome of the ocean beginning to understand the microorganisms that live in the ocean and how those microorganisms vary depending on the salinity of the water or the temperature of the water and allows us to understand how the ocean changes in response to environmental pressures. It's also given us insights into human evolution by studying populations that are affected by certain diseases. There are some people in those populations who are more vulnerable than others by looking at the genetic of the individuals who are less vulnerable, who are resistant to those diseases, gives us a sense of how we might develop therapies against the disease for those who are more sensitive. All of these revolutions in genomics have been enabled by an astonishing technological uh, set of advances in the ability to sequence uh, the genome. The graph shows in green the cost of sequencing a genome over time. The white line shows Moore's Law. So Moore's Law is from the computer world and uh, describes an extraordinary rate of progress, a fast rate of progress of so the number of transistors that can fit on a chip double every two years, but not just the number of transistors. That means the capacity of the chip and the speed of the chip. And this is considered to be very rapid progress. 
The progress in sequencing has gone even faster than the progress as described by Moore's Law. In 2001, when the human genome sequence was, the first human genome sequence was produced, it cost $3 billion. Today, you can sequence a human genome for $1,000, an extraordinary rap rate of progress. Now, what these two revolutions have given us is not just all the things I've described, but also, you'll get the theme, a parts list for the biological universe. So the living world can be dissected into a set of component parts, and guess who is interested in those parts? The engineers who love a parts list. And what we have seen is engineers picking up the parts of this parts list. And now that has led to what we would call a third revolution in biology, which is the convergence. And this is the bringing together of biology with the physical sciences and the engineering sciences to do very, very new and different things. I'm going to give you um, three examples. They're from MIT. I could give you examples from any number of places, and uh, you know the list goes on and on. But these are three that I think capture some of the promise. In the bottom left-hand uh, diagram is shown an innovation from the laboratory of Professor Sangeeta Bhatia at the Koch Institute at MIT. And what she's designed is a set of nanoparticles, they're shown in copper, that have little legs, and those little legs are peptides, the blue little squiggles that are attached to the nanoparticles. Every disease has its own molecular characteristics, and many diseases have particular enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that can cut other molecules. And what Professor Bhatia has designed are these peptides that are extended from these nanoparticles, the little green spots are the target of the enzyme, which is shown as the big green particle. And the idea is that if you have a particular disease and you're injected with this kind of a nanoparticle, you don't know whether or not you have the disease, this enzyme would cut those little legs off, those peptides off the particles, and they would then go into the blood system and be cleaned out into the urine. And so you could detect these little peptides and demonstrate whether you have or don't have a disease with very high fidelity, very high accuracy, and most importantly, very early in the disease process. The convergence goes well beyond biomedicine. It has implications for food, for water, for manufacturing, it has a lot of implications for energy. And I'm showing one possible, one actually not possible, one real application of the convergence, and this comes from the laboratory of Professor Angela Belcher. Uh, what Professor Belcher has been you know, just an expert is in getting small microorganisms, viruses and yeast, yeast, to do the work of manufacturing plants. In this case, I'm illustrating a virus that will synthesize a lithium oxygen battery. The battery that Professor Belcher's lab has been able to uh, persuade these viruses to make has very high capacity, um, probably two to three times the capacity of the current lithium-ion batteries, very lightweight, and would enable uh, electric cars to travel very much greater distances than currently are limited by the lithium-ion batteries they currently weigh, use. Now, there's an advantage in getting your viruses to do the hard work rather than a big hulking manufacturing plant. You'll need a manufacturing plant to do this, but standard battery fabrication happens at very, very high temperature. It's very energy intensive, and it spews out toxic byproducts. Viruses don't work that way. They make their batteries at room temperature with no toxic byproducts. So there are many, many advantages to this kind of new way of thinking about manufacturing, this new way of synthesizing objects. <clears throat> and it really opens a whole world of opportunity if you imagine letting biology do the very, very hard work rather than, you know, you or me sitting down trying to puzzle out how to put the components of the battery together, let the viruses do that work for us. My next example comes from the laboratory of Institute Professor Robert Langer, and it's a nanoparticle that's designed to attack cancer, designed to carry a cancer therapy directly to a cancer cell and kill it. There are a lot of problems in doing that, uh, how you protect the uh, chemotherapeutic agent from the rest of the body. And I'm going to show a little movie from um, Bob's lab that uh, conveys, I think, in a very compelling way how these anti-cancer nanoparticles work. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That, in turn, gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, 
the address where it should be delivered, a key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. Um, that's Bob there on the left in the uh, turquoise shirt. Now, um, I, I just want to assure you that when a cancer cell gets killed, it generally doesn't make that sound. <laughs> Obviously, I've been talking a lot about products of the, for the convergence, and I just want to show you a map of the Kendall Square uh, innovation uh, hub cluster that uh, Drew mentioned. It is a very, very vibrant place. The yellow buildings are MIT buildings surrounded by a cluster of companies in biopharma, in IT, in energy. And I would simply say, this is an incomplete accounting of the companies that surround MIT. <coughs> so the convergence has really wonderful promises in terms of not just discovering new things about how our world works, but also new products and new industries. So um, there are many convergence activities in the neighborhood. This next slide shows you the names of some at MIT, at Harvard, and many of them are MIT and Harvard together. One of the great, I think, um, successes and joys of the, my presidency was getting to work with Drew and creating opportunities for people to come together between both of our institutions to use our powers uh, synergistically. All of these institutes and activities that are shown up there are characterized by crossing disciplines and crossing institutions. So um, I believe that the technology story of the 21st century is going to come out of the convergence of the life sciences with engineering and the physical sciences, much as the story of the 20th century came out of that century's convergence. And I believe that this convergence is going to transform our lives as profoundly as the transformations that came out of the convergence of physics and engineering before. So um, where does the future come from? And how do we accelerate into that future? The convergence has been happening for many years, but it's been happening one by one. You know, two people getting together, having a great idea, and carrying that forward. But what we see in our faculties now are people who grew up during that first wave of the convergence, and they want to do more. And I think we can have them make it possible for them to do more. And the real question for us is how do we scale the one by one to a many by many approach? So how do we turn the promise of the convergence into practice? This is not a trivial question to answer. Research universities, we're great at what we do. We give, I, I think, deliver phenomenal education and do phenomenal scholarly research. We're often criticized for being a little bit sluggish, for perhaps being intransigent in the face of new opportunity. And we face, I think, something that it could be accurately described as Clay Christensen's innovator's dilemma. It is hard to innovate within a successful established organization. Now, of course, we ask our faculty to innovate and be creative independently, and do they do that magnificently? But can we create conditions where they can do it more effectively, synergistically, and produce more power by working together uh, than our current uh, structures allow? So as I said, this is not trivial. This is not just a question of, you know, try to mix it up and let the magic happen. It takes deliberate action to overcome the impediments, and the impediments are many. When you put biologists and engineers in the same room, they're raised in completely different environments. They speak different languages. They use a different vocabulary. Their understanding of how to approach a problem is very different. Uh, there are so many just structural, kind of intellectual impediments from them getting together. The way to solve it is actually create opportunities for them to learn to one another, learn from one another, and to learn to speak the same language, or at least to understand one another's language. In terms of uh, institutional structures, I mean, our institutions are set up in departments and schools, and that serves us very well. But how do we make it possible for people from different schools or even different institutions uh, to work together? Um, I'm not a fan of disrupting our current departments and schools, but I'm an enormous fan of creating super highways across departments, across schools, across institutions to give people the possibility of working together in new kinds of organizations. And now what I describe them is creating protected discipline free zones to allow people to work together. And in terms of interinstitutional collaborations, many of those that were listed on that slide with all the little um, uh, logos, each one of those is an experiment and collaboration, and each one we work very hard to establish the modes by which they can work together. Funding is actually critical for funding the future. Our funding agencies, our federal funding agencies are just as siloed as our universities are. 
The National Institutes of Health pursues a particular kind of direction. The National Science Foundation, another. Department of Energy, another. There's a little bit of overlap, but not enough. Um, and uh, as a colleague of my, mine um, pointed out as I was starting out on some of these adventures that I'll describe about a little later, that if you're herding cats, cat food helps. <laughs> and that's the role of funding. To bring these kinds of new activities together, you need flexible funding. You need both people to entice people to uh, come together in new kinds of ways. So seed funding is absolutely critical. So what I thought I'd do is offer an example, so rather than just describing the theory, and tell you how we put the theory into practice. When I arrived at MIT, I had conversations across the institute asking the same question every single time, which is what are MIT's opportunities and responsibilities for the decade or two ahead? Those conversations revealed to me that MIT had the people, they had the project, they had the passion, that if we had the conditions and the components to really make a state change in two areas, in energy and in the convergence. The energy story is a story for another day, but I want to talk a little bit about the convergence. A really critical element in all of this is leadership. I think an important role in leadership is to project the ambitions and the ethos that actually lies within members of the community, but that they think can't be addressed by an organization, or they'd like to participate, but don't yet know the way. And to demonstrate ways that people can accomplish more together than anyone could do on their own. So with the articulation of energy and the convergence as two big areas that MIT could play a very big role, began to build a consensus, if you will, an army of the willing, and you have to have an army of the willing to counter the forces that naturally align against any new approach. So the example I'm going to give is the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. This is the building that we built to house some of the members of the Koch Institute. The Koch Institute was designed with extraordinary attention to building connections across disciplines. As I said a moment ago, leadership is key. My leadership alone would never have been sufficient. We were enormously fortunate in a, having a great leader of the predecessor to the Koch Institute, the Center for Cancer Research. In Professor Tyler Jacks who's with us tonight. I told him I might embarrass him a little bit. Um, but he has been an extraordinary leader of this effort. He also recognized that you can't provide leadership on your own. And he began to assemble his own army of the willing. And key generals in that army were Institute professors Bill Sharp and Bob Langer. Bill Sharp is one of our Nobel Prize winners in physiology and medicine. Bob Langer, whose nanoparticle I just showed, um, is uh, an individual who probably holds the most US patents of anyone in the country and is an extraordinary entrepreneur. So with Bob on the engineering side and Phil on the biology side, Tyler became able to really bring this coalition of the willing together. The Koch Institute community extends beyond the building into many departments at MIT and other um, institutions in the region. And as I said, we structured the institute to bring people together. A standard floor of the Koch Institute is shown here. Almost every floor has both engineers and biologists. And then there's a central area that serves both the engineers and the biologists, so everyone has to use the same stairways, the same elevators, the same restrooms, excuse me, the same core. We also have core technology labs that people have access to, and that's a great place for uh, mixing it up for people running into one another. And of course, I talked about cat food before. We even have human food. First floor has a cafe, which is absolutely critical for um, uh, incubating the kinds of collaborations that we want to do. Part of the brilliance of Tyler's leadership is the, some um, social engineering as well. And there are a number of activities that were set up explicitly to bring biologists and engineers together so they could learn to understand one another's language and learn to dream about the future together. Um, and of course, the seed funding that I described before is critical to making these work. In addition to the work at the Koch, the Koch reaches across um, from MIT to the other cancer centers uh, in the Boston region. We felt that if we we're going to tackle cancer, we couldn't do it theoretically in the lab. We needed to bring the clinical expertise, people who saw cancer in the clinic, together with the scientists and the engineers so we could um, really get after the problems in a far more direct way. Um, now, the Koch Institute includes about 1,000 researchers. The projects abound. I talked about tech transfer before. I mentioned it. The Koch Institute in its first five years has seen five companies spin out. 
So it's also productive in terms of new uh, products and new industries. And this is a um, many institute, many institution-wide discipline-free zone. So let me talk now about how we move into the future and what are the risks to our innovation economy. There is no question that federal investments in basic R&D are the seed corn of our innovation economy. Bob Solo, another Nobel Prize winner this time in economics, showed that over 50% of the U.S. economic growth comes from technology. So um, if that's the case, let's look at how we're investing in the seed corn of our innovation economy. And the top left shows a graph uh, representing federal investments in R&D expressed as a percent of GDP, and you need only look at that top red line. This graph goes back to 1976. If I had a graph that took it back to 1960, it would be even more depressing. So nationally, we reached our peak investments in the mid-1960s, investing about 2% of GDP in federal R&D. Today, we're at about 0.8% of GDP. I would simply say that um, if you were an organization that believed that this was the primary resource for an innovation economy, the graph wouldn't look exactly like that. Um, and you know, it would be fine if the United States was in this business alone, but um, we are no longer because nations around the world have seen the extraordinary progress that has come out of America's innovation economy and are racing to do the same. The bottom right shows the change in R&D funding just in biomedicine for a number of different countries, and you will immediately see that the United States is not one of the leaders, but one of the laggards. Um, this is, um, I would say, a daunting um, view. And for any of you who wonder about what you get out of these investments in basic research, I will call out only one example, and I could give you dozens. Um, again, most of us are of an age where we saw the beginning of HIV AIDS. In 1980, this is a disease that didn't have a name. In 1981, all of a sudden we began to hear about it. We didn't know what the organism was. We didn't know anything about it at all. Now, you have to remember that the annual budget of NIH is now about $30 billion, and we've been investing a lot in basic biology, and we had been for several decades. Based on that foundation of basic biology, NIH invested another $15 billion in uh, HIV AIDS research and within a decade turned what was a death sentence into a chronic treatable disease. Let me remind you that by the mid-80s, it was projected without any particular um, exaggeration that every hospital bed in America was going to hold a dying HIV AIDS patient. $15 billion dollars. We turned a death sentence into a chronic treatable disease. That saved $1.4 trillion in hospital costs. It has given HIV AIDS patients the possibility of a normal lifespan, and that $1.4 trillion does not factor in the economic benefit of having people in the workforce. It's also a great example of convergence. David Ho, who is responsible for engineering the multi-drug treatment for HIV AIDS, is a product of a Harvard and MIT education. The, the Health Science and Technology Program, and he describes his understanding of this multi-drug strategy. He described how important his mathematics and physics background was in coming up with that solution. So what do we need for our nation to continue to make our progress in the innovation economy of the 21st century? We need to maintain, we need to expand federal investments in basic research. We need to create ways that funding can you know, work between the silos of federal funding agencies. And we also need to be sure that we have policies that support, support investments in innovation. And the kind of innovation I'm talking about are real objects. We're talking about drugs. We're talking about machines. We're talking about capital-intensive industries. You've got to put a lot of money in if you're going to manufacture something, even if it's manufactured by viruses. And we're also talking about long-cycle industries from the discovery of the HER2 gene and then the development, the um, marketing of the Herceptin, the drug for breast cancer, 20 years. Very, very long-term investments, and we have to be aware of this and be sure that our policies support that kind of uh, investment. So um, how do we change the promises, turn the promises into practice of the convergence and think about the challenges of the 21st century. So to my mind, as I think about what are the 
hardest problems that we as a world need to really address over the relatively near term. First is food and water, sufficiency and security. The planet is anticipated to have eight to nine billion people on it. If you actually, if you do the math on that, that means there'll be um, the food to feed each of those people come from a half an acre of land. We don't have the technologies now to do that, but we could coming out of the convergence. Sustainable energy will require new battery technologies of the sort I described, but also new sources of fuels. Those will come out of the convergence. And in terms of healthcare, increasing access, increasing accuracy, and reducing cost, that will require more technology, not less. And those technologies will come out of the convergence. And so I would simply ask you, might we not assemble a national ambition, a national ethos around any one of these three? I would hope so, because I would hope that young people who are in second grade, perhaps, or 12th grade, or at our universities could feel that kind of wind at their back of a national ambition that would encourage them to contribute. So the conditions aren't marvelous, but I remain an optimist. And um, I will offer this quotation from Edwin Land, one of our local heroes, where he clearly understood that when you make possible the concentrated interplay of separate contributions of creative individuals, you come up with enormously important changes. I don't think we're gonna be able to stop the convergence. It's currently happening. In MIT School of Engineering, among our 400 faculty in that school, about a third are already using the parts lists, parts lists of the life sciences in their work. The students are wildly enthusiastic about it. Our students want to solve the great problems and they see the convergence as a wonderful tool to solve them. So the question for us as universities or the question for us as a nation is can we expand from a one by one approach to a full throttle attack on these problems? And I would simply say that as um, consumers of interesting new technologies, keep your eyes and ears tuned. The future we have not yet imagined is upon us. Your next, even smarter phone will have awesome computing power and it's likely to be able to tell you who you are and how you're feeling. The possibilities of the convergence are truly beyond our imaginations. So I will close by quoting my younger self, but it would be fun. <laughs> Thank you for your interest. Quite inspiring, quite exciting. Uh, we now have time for questions. We have microphones here and here, also up in Louis, but uh, just come to the microphone. And let me just remind you that a good question uh, has several elements. One, you identify yourself. Second, you keep it short with one thought. And finally, most importantly, it ends with a question mark. Um, so if you'd line up, but I'd like to take the moment to start with a question for me, uh, which is that, um, you talked about World War II as partly an inspiration for this kind of thing. None of us wish a world war. Um, uh, and that, that was a time of really intense investment and probably if you've gone back to World War II, the numbers would be even more depressing than the 60s. Can, number, two, two part question. One, can you imagine an event, a convergence, an excitement, something that would create that kind of energy. You know, what was interesting about your HIV example is, yes, we went, we, we focused on one thing and we went to fix it, and of course in doing so we learned a bunch, but wasn't it still a small drop in your bucket? Then the second part, which is maybe related but maybe different, um, you didn't say anything about the role of business in this story. And you did show us some examples where businesses were, but, and what's interesting is, of course, you mentioned that universities and the government are siloed and they're kind of slow afoot sometimes, although uh, we're, you're working very hard to make that not true. Um, and, you know, we need to create these highways. Business is thought of being quite fleet afoot. It, it brings together ideas, it's, but it's focused on making money and it's often very focused on short-term gain. So those are two ways of trying to get this revolution, as you say, accelerated into the future. Any thoughts you have on either one of those would be great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll do the second one first because the implications for business are astonishing. And I tried to convey that because the 
uh, the companies that now make these were little startup companies not so long ago. So the array of startup companies that are pouring out of the convergence are going to be major, not just new companies, but I believe new industries in the not too far distant future. I'm fortunate, my crystal ball just ends up getting pretty fuzzy after 10 years. And so I don't know what the names of those industries are gonna be, but they will certainly happen. And um, there is happily uh, renewed enthusiasm for investing in these kinds of businesses that has come back since the uh, economic downturn. So I think that's great. Uh, the only hesitation I have about business is the thing I described at the end, is that there is a lot of enthusiasm for a quick turnaround of money. Uh, so if you can invest in a software company and make your money back in less than a year, why would you invest in a new cancer therapeutic company when you're not gonna make your money back for a longer time? And I think as a nation, we should look pretty hard at how we privilege investments and perhaps weight the scale a little bit. Um, on the first one is, you know, how bad does it have to get <laughs> before we get motivated? Um, and I'm afraid to say I don't have a good answer to that. Um, and it, it is, um, I find it, um, it gives me great sorrow. Um, we've had a couple of terrible things happen. You know, the World Trade Towers came down. We had the worst economic debacle since the Great Recession, Great Depression. Um, neither of those was enough for the United States to kind of, you know, pull up our boots and say, well, we better start running. And so I don't know how bad it has to get. On the good side is that people are racing to this anyway. But one of my fears is that um, we have a generation now, I call them generation why not, because as soon as you describe a problem, they push up, they say, oh, I can fix that. And so the, you, the students we see on our campuses are so ready to um, put their shoulder to a big task and they'll do it anyway, but it's a little bit like one by one versus many by many. If we could just set out some avenues that they could march down, I think as a nation, we'd benefit even more greatly from their great passion for making the world a better place. Great, Let's start right over here. Thank you very much for a very provocative presentation. Today is the 20th. Can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm Marcy Merninghan, and I'm an alum uh, of Harvard of the Ed School, and I taught for a while courses on money and morality at Harvard Divinity School, and continue to work in the field of ethics and economic decision making for about 30 years. And my question is about ethics. Today is the 25th anniversary of the World Wide Web. And Sir Tim Berners-Lee has called for a Magna Carta for the web that would enshrine certain principles having to do with responsibility, privacy, uh, respect in uh, response to many of the uh, behaviors that have been exhibited by government agencies. Included in his recommendation is an examination of the ethics of technology. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of that theme or meme, which seems to run throughout all of what you described. Yeah, Thank so you. Um, the ethics of our technologies are critically important. And um, someone very wise, and I can't remember that right now, who said it, it, it's not the technology that are good, it is good or evil, it's the people who use them. And we always have to be aware of the potential uh, bad users of our technology, but we also can't let that inhibit us from de developing the technologies uh, to our benefit. You know, as you look at the story of Kendall Square, uh, one of the reasons that the biotechnology uh, industry began here and in San Francisco, but why it began here with Biogen is that um, Cambridge was very concerned about the uses of uh, recombinant DNA, genetic engineering, and actually established some guidelines that would allow some things and not allow other things. And having those guidelines actually allowed these companies to get started. So I think we can't be blind uh, to the possibly down, possible downsides of these technologies. And we have to approach them not by saying, well, we can't do them because they could be dangerous. But we have to, again, marshal the forces of the good against the possible forces of the evil so we can continue to progress into the future. And I would say this is one of the great challenges of university leadership because um, there are so much, uh, you know, there, it is a natural response to something new to say, oh, we couldn't do that. I don't know enough about it. And, you know, we'll never know enough about anything uh, to feel completely satisfied that what we, the direction we're moving will be entirely benign. It won't be entirely benign. So we have to be aware of these issues as we move forward. Right up here. 
Hi, my name is Stephen Smith. I'm a graduate of the college. Um, Bill Gates has made the point that businesses are not very good at investing long term in science or you know, health or innovation and that the role of government is really to make those early stage investments. President Obama has tried to feature this as a, an important priority of his administration and really hasn't gotten much traction. And it seems to me that there's a general skepticism in the Republican Party around the ability of government to make such successful investments. So my question is, um, is there a role for uh, leaders like you and President Faust in, a, in an environment where political leadership has become, uh, in a way, de delegitimized by a culture of commentary and skepticism? Is there an appropriate role for university leaders to help educate uh, the public and the political actors around the importance of this priority, because it does seem that you're speaking to a very salient point that, that appeals to both parties, which is that 50 percent of economic growth in America comes from these kind of investments. Sorry for the long question, but what do you see the role, your role a, as, a, as a public leader in a university in intersecting with that public process? Yeah, so I think it is definitely part of a president's role. Certainly the president of MIT has played a role in Washington since before the Second World War. And I was in Washington a day every four to six weeks to advance uh, sound policies for education and research. And university presidents must serve this role. However, um, I should actually go back and look at that declining investment of R&D and somehow map it against dysfunctionality in Congress. There was a day when this was a bipartisan issue. Um, you know, budgets for investing in the early R&D phases were people at something everyone recognized as absolutely essential to the nation's future. Some of the problem is short-termism, uh, a problem that the dean has called out. But some of the problem is just, uh, you know, as, as far as I see it, a, a, a Congress just it can't let either one, uh, you know, get a win, which is a terrible situation. And um, I think that um, university presidents have continued to, you know, play the role of trying to educate uh, Congress, but because that is um, slow and terrible work, presidents also spend a lot of time, you know, finding people who want to help support these kinds of things. And I cannot um, overemphasize the role of private philanthropy in getting these activities off the ground. So even with great investments, important investments in uh, early R and D by the government. We still have to get out ahead of the, the curve to the future by investing early in things that even the government couldn't support. I want to just call out one thing uh, that is implicit in what you said, which is what is the role of the government? And these early stage researchers, it is, um, you know, I, I don't know how to f fully convey how unknown these investments are. <laughs> so the belief is if you just kind of invest in understanding the way the world works, the way the universe operates, the basic laws of biology, the basic laws of physics, they will at some point become parts of solutions to some very big problem. These are not investments that companies can make. And so these are, com these are investments that I believe the nation has a responsibility to make uh, to provide the elements that are then taken up by industry and turned into products in the not so near term. You know, but but in a reasonably uh, reasonable terms in terms of how businesses calculate return. Thank you. Over here. Hello, my name is Jacob. I'm a freshman at the college and member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Uh, you mentioned the generation Why Not and many of the problems they're trying to address. I would argue that one of the largest problems of the coming generation is probably climate change. So I was wondering if you could discuss what the role of institutions such as yours and scientific institutions will be in an increasingly political debate about climate change. Yeah, great question, and thank you for asking. And thank you for being here. I'm always impressed when uh, 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 freshmen and sophomores are, are part of this forum. I think it's great. So um, I would say that in the great challenges of the world, I would uh, call out sustainable energy as, as among the most threatening. And so climate change is part of it. Uh, energy demand that's going to double by 2050 is part of it. And uh, the MIT Energy Initiative was actually uh, founded uh, to try to accelerate finding solutions to these problems. The Energy Initiative's theme is all of the above. So we love those alternative energy technologies that are frankly not ready for prime time and they're not gonna be ready for prime time no matter what level of investments we put in for another 20 or 30 years. Suffice it to say, if we put no investments in, they're never gonna be ready. 
Um, but there are a ways out. So it's important to invest in those and to bring you know, the greatest minds uh, into finding those alternative solutions. But it's also important to work on the technologies of today and improving the technologies of today. And the Energy Initiative at MIT works on those very, very uh, seriously. The climate change debate is a political debate. It's not a scientific debate. And it addresses the question earlier about just funding. And um, I don't have a great solution for how we are going to um, move that debate along to the point where we can develop the federal policies that I think are necessary for countering it. But for your generation, what would I be worried about? It's one of the great deficits that we will have given to you. And I think we need to come up with solutions very, some solutions very, very uh, rapidly. But again, on the positive side, there is an army of the willing who are working on those solutions today. And um, given a little bit of encouragement, enough funding, we'll have those solutions in place in time. Right over here. Uh, thanks for the great talk. My name is Mohamed Yildirim. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Kennedy School. Uh, basically, the cross-hybridization between fields is important for advancing the science. But I have a question about the future of interdisciplinary research in academia especially. Mm -hmm. So basically, I'll use myself as an example, uh, selfishly. Uh, yes, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a PhD in physics from Harvard, applied physics from Harvard. Now I'm working at the Center for International Development. But this year I have been looking for jobs, for instance, faculty positions. And what I realized was, although we are encouraging the interdisciplinary research, uh, there is not much to do for transdisciplinary scientists, mm -hmm. like the departments, the other institutional uh, structures in the academia is not very accommodative. So what can the universities do yes. to be more accommodative? Very great question. So when we persuade people to work at the intersection, where will they live? Where will they work? So with this, this is one of the reasons why I'm a strong proponent of using, creating these new dom domains, but on the base of, on the foundation of our standard departments and schools. I don't know what the departments of 10 years from now would be named, but I like you know, mechanical engineering, I like chemistry, I like English. I mean, th they seem like you know, good foundation stones. So rather than you know, creating entirely new entities that are hard to place, what we require of our students, and I think it's very wise, is a very deep disciplinary knowledge, and then a cross-cutting awareness and cross-cutting knowledge. And it's hard to ask people to master two worlds, but I think that um, really is the answer until these cross-disciplinary areas become mature enough to be able to stand on their own. And that doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't happen for a while. Right up here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tiffany Lazo, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, I wanted to go back to the first question on the ethics of science. Um, I was interested in um, how do we define where, eth where the ethics, ethical boundaries of science should be defined in terms of a policy and science perspective? And how do we work with public policy so that they do not limit technological research that may put us behind as compared to other countries that may have different views on sciences and different ethics? Yeah, so this is a very gr important question. And um, I don't know that anyone has sufficient foresight to be able to understand the distant implications. We can get a glimpse of the distant implications, but it's hard to know them for sure. And one of the things that scientists have done in good times is come together to actually think about what are the implications and to set up basically self-regulation, you know, to set up boundaries. You know, these, this is work you can do, that's work you can't do. Of course, um, this is done discipline by discipline and nation by nation. So your question has a very um, particularly difficult twist to it, which is that even if there's an understanding of what the appropriate limits might be for a particular kind of exploration or particular kind of experimentation, that doesn't mean that those limits are going to be respected in another country. There's another uh, you know, layer of this, which is really quite, um, makes things difficult today, which is what are the standards for truth? What are the standards of knowledge? How do we evaluate work that comes out of another culture, out of another country? And these are part of the, uh, I think, the tensions in increasingly internationalized activities around um, areas of really of great interest to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Right up here. Hi, my name is Max. I'm also a freshman at the college. And I, my question may approach your role as an educator a bit more than your role as a scientist. There's been a growing wave of concern, I think, at a lot of universities, uh, including certainly here at Harvard, about the fall in the humanities and about fewer students, for instance, choosing to study the humanities. 
Um, but at the same time, President Obama and members of the government have been encouraging a growth in STEM fields and for more students to study those fields. So given that students are more or less choosing not to study the humanities, and it's sort of a natural shift, to what extent do you think, as a university president or as an educator, we should treat that as a problem? And if we should treat it as a problem, what do you see as some of the solutions? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question and a question that's been on my mind for decades. And I think most places, while the number of majors in the humanities may be flow, falling, the number of students who are taking those courses remains high because uh, many people understand the importance of uh, thinking hard about the great problems of humankind. And those problems are thought about best through the humanities and social sciences. Uh, well, when we were at Yale, uh, Plyanth Brooks, one of the great uh, English literature uh, explicators, uh, said to us, you know, uh, science can tell you how things work, but they can't tell you why. And um, I think a good education has a balance uh, between the two. I don't think it's appropriate for scientists and engineers not to be educated in the humanities and social sciences, nor do I feel that it's appropriate for students who are studying the humanities and social sciences not to have real understanding of the operation of science, engineering, and mathematics. And I think that's part of the responsibility of institutions like Harvard and MIT is to help guide our students in this important phase of their education so that they get an integrated appreciation of how you approach the world. So it is not simply um, a question of how you get to the right answer um, through science and math and engineering, but why that right answer matters. Right down. Yeah, <coughs> excuse me. I'm Chris Russell. I'm a fellow at the Belfer Center and also teaching a class on the media, energy, and environment. And I've covered both 20th century science and 21st century science, and I loved your journey from um, second grade on. I guess my question is, as an example, when the war on cancer started, the big analogy in 1971 was, if we can put a man on the moon, we can cure cancer. And it was approached simplistically for the Congress and that analogy is used over and over and over again in things that are more biological. Uh, so my question is, how do you uh, guard against both overpromise? Does this convergence of the 21st century help people make better connections? And also, how do you make the argument for basic research since a lot of the cancer funding was actually used by people who applied for cancer funding but said, I want to study the basic cell, and then they applied that to the HIV problem. So I guess from basic research, man on the moon, and overpromise, uh, <laughs> your comments. Yeah, I, it's um, hard not to overpromise. Um, but I think one of the things that we learned, uh, the war on cancer was announced in 71, 71. Uh, and we were going to spend $100 million, and it was going to take eight years. Um, so just hold that in your mind for a second. One of my favorite reflections this year that I heard was in a conversation with Jerry Friedman, who's one of our great physicists, and uh, this was in September. And he said, you know, physicists, he's a physicist, right? Physicists, you know, we have ways of explaining 4% of the physical universe. 4% are atoms. The other 96% is dark matter and dark energy, and we have no idea what that is. And I thought, wow, that's so exciting because there's so much for our students to do. Um, but on the other hand, I thought, wow, in biology, I don't think we know what the numbers are. And whether it's 4% or 0.00004%, we don't know. And we launched into the war on cancer, I think, with great goodwill and great ambition. Uh, and I don't think we know even yet the complexity of the biological universe. I wish I could tell you that we knew 2%. We only have another 98% to understand before we can really get our hands around cancer entirely. But um, I would say that the kind of approach we're taking is the only way to, uh, to uh, you know, get to the point where we, you know, we can cure some cancers now. We'll be able to cure more later. But your question really at its heart is, how do we set out a national ambition, a national ethos that isn't going to end in tears <laughs> and the disappointment of feeling that it is just too hard and too complicated? The dollars that were invested in, uh, in the war in cancer were very well invested. 
we learned a huge amount that we needed to know to actually really tackle cancer. I would say parenthetically that the decision to start, to start the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research really was a shift in direction, moving from the point where we just have to do the basic biology, believing that we have enough basic biology in our hands now to begin to turn toward real applications. It's the reason that the Koch Institute has clinicians side by side with the biologists and the engineers, because we are really very serious about approaching cancer as a problem, because we think we're ready. We may be defeated again. Uh, we will certainly be defeated, but um, it's a question of timing. We're going to have time just for these last two questions. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm uh, from an, uh, Kennedy School the fellow from China. Uh, thank you for your presentation about uh, 21st uh, the scientific uh, future. My question is, uh, how, could, how should the uh, U.S. scientists uh, uh, cooperate with the developing countries mm -hmm. to resolve, uh, to solve the global environment uh, problem? Thank you for your question. It is a very important question, and how should uh, the United States scientists cooperate with scientists around the world on any number of topics. Um, I am a huge fan of academic diplomacy. So the work that goes on between countries is a very important link, important network that binds our countries together. And I think working together is absolutely critical to obviously the world's future, but also to the relationship between our country. Um, one of the um, things that's marvelous about science and technology, or science and engineering, is even though we speak different languages roughly between biology and engineering, the same language is spoken around the world. And I think it provides a tremendous framework for our nations to work together to solve these really great global problems. And American scientists, I know, are working with colleagues all around the world as they pursue um, their, their science and their inventions. Uh, my name is Madeline Jenkins, and I'm a freshman at the Institute. Um, my question is, so you were talking about the difficulty in getting pharmaceutical companies to invest in drugs that will take a longer term to develop, such as like 10 years, 20 years. And so my concern related to that is that after they have developed that drug and are able to put it on the market, the patent that they have is limited in time span so that when the patent that they have on the drug runs out and generic brands come out, they're not making back the money from their investment in the drug. And obviously, we don't want to make drugs prohibitively expensive because that gets in the way of access to healthcare. But how do we resolve this problem then to get companies to invest in drugs on the longer term? Yeah, so it's a great question. And this relates to this you know, puzzle that I, I set out at the end is, you know, what are our federal policies? To, you know, are they set in a way that encourage long-term capital-intensive industries uh, to flourish? And I think the pharmaceutical industry is one of them. I um, generally hear the opposite question from what you've asked is, you know, why do the drug companies make so much money from their drugs? Um, but you are appropriately asking a very important question is how can a drug company stay in business if the time of the patent is limited? Um, it's a balance. And um, one of the things that's very exciting that's happening now, I think it's a very good thing, and you'll see why I think it's a very good thing in a second, is that drug companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, are, are now turning back to alliances with universities, with research laboratories, to help the early stage development. And so they're deciding how to use their capital in ways that um, may be more efficient in terms of economic efficiency, but also will provide greater integration of the people who are pursuing these great ends in all many different domains in our society, in uh, research laboratories at universities and small startups. And I think that that is a very uh, important strategy for reconciling the economics of drug development uh, rather than a uh, pharmaceutical company believing that they have to maintain a um, biology department that's twice the size of Harvard's and, and, and MIT's combined in order to do the early stage development. So I think that um, um, it will, it, it is being worked out in real time. The drug companies, I hope, will be more successful in bringing drugs to market. They've kind of slowed. But I'm hoping that by uh, refocusing their early efforts on the kinds of innovations that are happening in the laboratories here at Harvard and MIT and on the startup companies that come out of it, encouraging, actually, many of the drug companies are investing in startup companies, that it will change the um, economics enough to help them to continue to be successful in producing the pharmaceuticals that will 
cure disease and make our, all of our lives healthier and longer. One last question. We're here at the Kennedy School. We're all about educating and um, training exceptional public leaders. Public leaders meaning people who care about the public interest, whatever sector they're in and so forth. Uh, we often have uh, heads of state. I see Felipe Calderon, former president of Mexico here, and we ask such people, um, what would it take to become a head of state? What do I, should I be doing? So um, here's my question to you. It's rather obvious, which is, first, should people in this audience aspire to be university presidents? It's hard <laughs> to imagine a more remarkable public leadership post. And if they did, what should they do? Ah, OK. <laughs> well, I have to just confess, I never aspired to be a university <laughs> president. Um, and actually, the leaders of our great universities in this nation are uh, great academics. And so I think that what's critical to leading a great university is believing in the fundamental purpose, the mission of the university, which is education and scholarship. And the best preparation for being a university leader is being totally committed to the education of our students, to the pursuit of our research um, agenda. And the only thing I would add, as I think back about my past and how I got myself in this trouble of being a university president, um, a broad curiosity. So one of the great delights of getting to know university presidents um, is that these are people of astonishing breadth of curiosity. And the fact that I couldn't keep my mind in my hands out of the history of art department or the chemistry department or the school of architecture uh, really was what consigned me to eventually this particular line of work. Thank you very much. Susan Hockley. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the lovely evening uh, on your way home.